Welcome to Stargate SG-1 for the first time, still not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I'm watching Stargate SG-1 for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Stargate SG-1, but I'm watching it for the 47th time. However, for the very first time, I am looking for what Stargate is trying to teach us. I'm watching through that lens of what's the show trying to say. What are those sci-fi messages holding up mirrors to society, giving us hope that things can be better in the future, or can we just plain be better human beings to one another? Brett, this week we're going to watch Stargate SG-1's version of Take Me Out to the Holla Suite. This is fair game. This is going to be the sports episode of SG-1. We'll find out here in a few minutes. Why don't you tell us about fair game? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this is third episode of season three, fair game, original air date, July 9th, 1999, right in the middle of summer. You know, so Stargate wasn't necessarily, I guess, one of those uh, kick it off in September and run through April type of shows, you know. They took advantage of the off seasons for all the network stuff. Right, right, very much so. Uh, Today's episode is written by Robert C. Cooper, directed by Martin Wood, two names you should be very familiar with. Jeff, I have a list of notes prior to watching the episode. They're all going to have to wait till we're done, though. Oh, wow. A bunch of stuff to talk about, some fun stuff. Fun little tidbits uh, to to go through. Didn't Martin Wood? Didn't Martin Wood direct just uh, like two episodes ago? He was out of mind. I think was the last one he did. Yeah, Martin Wood directs like some stupid number of episodes. Yeah, he is, and Robert C. Cooper writes some stupid number of episodes. <laughs> like that's there's a few guys I'm going to point out every time. D- Peter DeLuise, Robert C. Cooper, Brad Wright. These are the guys I'm going to point out. Everybody else is just sort of the the jobbers coming in and out, you know? Right, popping in. But with that, Jeff, why don't we go ahead and jump into this episode, Fair Game, and find out exactly how high we can run up the score. Oh, I get it. I was like, I was like what score? Oh, because it's a sports yeah, episode. Yeah, it's a sports episode. Here's a question. If they were going, okay, so there's uh, the Niners. Yep. And then there's the Fivers. Are these guys the Wonners? They're the Wonders. The O'Neaters. The O'Neaters? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go watch this episode. Hey, listen, if you guys are joining us for the very first time, first of all, welcome. You're amazing. You're awesome. Thank you guys so much. We try to make this up front as short as we possibly can. I'm making it longer by talking about how short we try to make it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to watch this episode. We're going to do it right now. If you're watching us right now, uh, that means you're either on YouTube or Patreon or some other video streaming platform. Uh, If you're on YouTube, you're going to catch us doing the reaction. We're going to get that kind of chopped up piece uh, that's all nice and good and pretty. If you want the full unedited behind the scenes version, head over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash nerds, And you guys can catch all of that action over there. If you're listening on an audio pod catcher, that's what they call those things, the podcast app, you're about to gate into the future where you're going to hear my for the first time reactions. You're going to hear the sci-fi messages that Brent found. Also, the massive list of notes that he's already teased. So why don't you join us on the other side as we watch Fair Game. All right, Jeff, you have just finished watching Fair Game for the very first time. I've watched it now for the 48th time looking for messages. You get to take us through your first time viewing experience. Let us relive it through you, buddy. What was it like? Well, it wasn't a baseball episode. There were no sports in this one. Truth. A little disappointing about that. But you know what? You know what I love? I love bureaucratic episodes. Mm. We're like, oh, oh gosh, you would, wouldn't you? I, yeah, totally. Oh, that's like so your thing. <laughs> TNG's Ensign's a Command, right, with the Shellyak, and they're like yeah, yeah, yeah. diving into their treaty and everything. I love that stuff. And they did a great job with this one. This was, I, I, I love this episode. This was great. It had intrigue. It had politics. It had uh, a promotion. We got Major Sam Carter now, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. We met three new system lords. We met Kronos, you, and Nirti who Jack calls nerdy, pretty great. <laughs> and we learned a whole lot. We had Thor on board as well, and we learned about this uh, protected planets treaty, and the Asgard are trying to help get Earth under it. Yeah. Oh, gosh, there are just so many. Even as I'm talking, there's so many layers to this this episode. So for, for the record, 
I do think we've heard of the Protected Planets Treaty. For everyone out there who's watching, I fully confess this might be just what's in Brent's head. But I do believe the planet of Samaria, which is where we first met Thor, Mm -hmm. or the old Viking planet, I believe that is part of the Protected Planets Treaty, which is why they had Thor's hammer on that planet to protect the planet. I I believe. I could be wrong. But I believe that that was a part of the Protected Planets Treaty. And uh, I did misspeak earlier. I don't think it was during the episode of, of Korai where we learned that Kronos killed Tilk's father. I think it actually might have been this episode where we learned that we killed his father. Weird that I hadn't heard that then. Now, I, I, I would be surprised if Samaria was part of the Protected Planets Treaty because my under, and this is just my understanding. They wouldn't need Thor's hammer there to protect them because they have the treaty. Yeah. And, you know, and as soon as that hammer was down, the Gould were, they were in, they were, they were attacking. And so, I mean, that, that would completely violate the treaty as I understand my limited understanding of it. You're, you're right about that. You're right about that. And that's why I say, I think, I think it is, but you know, as, as shows often do sometimes, you know, sometimes a he turns into a she all of a sudden. Why not? And I don't mean that. I'm sorry. I don't mean that disrespectfully to any of our trans friends out there. That That's not, please don't take that. That's, that's not what I meant for that. Well, if anything else, I think it's validating, right? Because yeah, that's what happens. Yeah. I, well, in this case, I'm literally just talking about the transition between Nirti, uh, who is referenced as a he, and now all of a sudden, Nirti's a she. So uh, that, that's all I'm talking about. The retcon, just the the unspoken retcon. Go ahead. A one letter retcon. Yeah. Add an S. There you go. It happened to spot many times. Yes. Yes. Give me a buzz. We got a lot of buzzes in this one. <laughs> like we. Go ahead. It's good thing we're not playing the rule of three anymore. We would have lost it within the first like eight minutes of the right, show. Right. So as I'm thinking about this and talking about it, like there's more and more layers to this and like the complexity of the episode is really starting to like, I'm really starting to notice it because on it, on the surface, this is a direct follow up from what we saw with, uh, with la- last week with Hathor killing Hathor. And so, oh my gosh, you killed Hathor. You're a for reals threat. So the system lords are coming for you. They're going to take a break from their infighting. Because like one of my notes was like, they're always fighting each other all the time. How are they such an intergalactic threat when they're always fighting each other? Mm-hmm. And we got a little bit of an answer on that. And that the Asgard have a greater enemy in their galaxy. So they're like, yeah, I, I, we can't do anything. You know, I mean, good luck. Imagine the Gould if they were aligned. Like if they had one system lord and they like united them, yeah. doesn't matter if you have five races, they're gonna bowl over everybody. Well, and and that's what they and that's what Thor said. Like the, their greatest fear is that the gold would unite under a single system lord. Or Tilk said that, or something like that. So on the surface, they're coming to blow up Earth, and Thor comes around to say, "Hey, there's this treaty. We can negotiate our way to some peace." And it's a pretty crappy uh, negotiation where it's all. You know, hey, you can give up this and give up this and give up that. Also give up both of your Stargates. And then, hey, we probably won't attack you. So mm-hmm. how do you go? And so that's that's the surface level of this. But then you have this other layer in here of the infighting of the system lords going on that just played out as the three representatives that were negotiating. Another layer of, we didn't get confirmation on it, but what I believe was Thor testing not only Jack, not only humanity, Thor testing not only humanity, but Jack specifically. Mm. The last time we saw the Asgard fifth race, right here you are. You're going to be, you're on your way. You have great potential. And Jack's like, bro, we're already out there. We're doing this now. The Asgard, are like, can we, can we engage? Are you ready for that next step? Right, right, right. And so I believe that he intentionally set up just this crappy deal. For them that like nobody in their right mind would take just to see if Jack had the guts to stand up and say no, or even better, what happened here, figure out a way to get everything you want. So we had this, this whole, I mean, God, it was just great. Excellent Jack episode. He shined in this whole thing. So here's a question. Here's a question. Near T never confessed to being the one who got Kronos. Right. Like as far as we know, it just so happens she has a technology to make herself invisible, which she showed us, and then she went a little crazy and tried to run away. But there was never a, okay, yeah, I did this. So was it Thor that did that? Was it actually Thor? You know, and Nirti was just running because she freaked. 
I love it. Creating the situation and everything. What's Jack going to do when I put this thing into play? I love that idea. And the, the validation. By the way, we have I'm that sorry. That, that would be antithetical to who Thor is as a, as a person, as a character. Would it? I'm telling you that, that it would be antithetical to Thor, but it could happen. I, I mean. He, it was clear to me that he is, he's Thor. He's the God of thunder. Yeah. But there's also a council, an Asgard council that kind of tells him what's up and what to do. Got his boss. Maybe, he, maybe this wasn't, yeah. They're like, hey, go, go do this thing. We need, don't kill him, right? Just, just go knock him out. See what happens. Create this situation to just like, where are these people in, in their development? Mm -hmm. The validation we have that that might have happened was before the attack, Thor's like, hey, I'm out. I got to head back home. There's some stuff going on. And then the episode ended with him leaving. So he stuck around the whole time to watch. What I'm excited about now is like Earth is in the intergalactic politics now. Not only are this this force that are popping up on planets and causing problems for the Gould, they're a force to be reckoned with. They outwitted the Gould. Yeah. Who cares if Nirti did it or not? Jack made a huge Kirk level bluff that not only paid off, it paid off to the point that like they almost killed like you and Nirti almost killed each other. Is is perfect. I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to take that back. This was not Kirk level. This was Sheridan level. Oh yes. Can't say it any better than that. Maybe, maybe even Sinclair level. I mean, that was pretty good. It was pretty good. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So this was a great episode. I, I had a couple other little notes on here, just like uh, Thor pulled the whole Star Trek thing of, hey, they're coming to blow you up, but we're the only ship in the sector. So you're not going to have a lot of help from us. And my thought was like, if this is such an existential crisis for the potential fifth race, where are the Nox? Where are the furlings? Right. Like there's these these other races that we were told about. And I can understand the Nox. They're nonviolent, you know, but but hey, bring them in and maybe help them come up with a thing. What about the Tolan? What about the Tokra? The Tolan. What about any of these people that we've made friends with? This could have been that episode where they all come together and then we get a big fight. I like, though, what we got better than that at this point. There's the whole thing about Tilk and his dad. Tilk really this was like we've been seeing a lot more emotion out of Tilk. He's been getting fired up. Things like that. And here we saw him. I mean, he, he didn't do anything wrong, but he refused to support uh, the, the the Gould that were coming on board. He refused to give up his yep. his weapon. There's my little thumbs up for people because I'm now, you know, I'm on a Mac. <gasps> no, this was this was I, I really. And the more I talk about the more I talk about this episode, the more I, I really, really liked it. We even introduced a politician. Secretary of Defense Sims, and he wasn't like just this horrible, evil, bad guy. Like, how amazing is that? So I love this one. Brent, what sci-fi? Well, first, you have a list of notes to share, and then then I want to know your sci-fi thoughts after that. Yeah, so so short short little handful. One, let's, let's do our update our count uh, here. We got one for crying out loud in this episode. Yep. And uh, that is going to bring us up to 16 for crying out louds by our count. We also have five, five Daniel deaths on screen. Five. Okay. I think I said three. There's been five. That's a lot of times to die in less than two, three seasons. Do we want to count his butt hairstyle as it, like that finally died? <laughs> Thank Hopefully God, that was permanent. I got to tell you, when you watch the show and you go back to the beginning and you see that hairstyle and you're like, oh my gosh. Uh, and we still have one Tilk indeed. So those are, those are our three tracking pieces right now. Uh, yeah, a, c a couple of notes. Uh, we do note Sam got her promotion to major. Sorry, Harry Kim. You still have to wait. We mentioned near T, uh, everything going on with that. What I love about the near T thing and, and even a few of the other things we've seen in this particular episode, even bringing back Thor, more of the system Lords, which Jeff, I know you've wanted to know more about the system Lords. This has been a thing that you've, that you've, uh, yep. Said, I told you there's an episode coming up this season that's going to give you some answers and more insight into something you've been wondering about. And this this is what I was referring to. But I, I love this just goes back to prove that. So you had that Cassandra episode, mm -hmm. which seemed very episode of the week. Here's this person. How many times have you seen Cassandra since then? Twice, maybe three times. And, and in pivotal stuff. That was a pretty cool thing. Right. But it's not like she's like a part of the cast now in a part of the story, right? But all of a sudden we bring back Nerti. So we're, we're bringing back, we're interconnecting things a little bit more, making more connections, uh, which I love quite a bit. 
But uh, the other thing is uh, we brought back that the Chronos is the Ashrak who or the the gold who sent the Ashrak to kill Jolinar. Yeah, that sort of stuff. Just this show is connected. It's not serialized, but things do matter and come back again. Uh, but the other thing too, there are things I, I mentioned this during the 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 watch through. There are some things, Jeff, that I would love to just sit back and be like, I'm going to not mention that or bring that up, and I'm going to let you catch it on the second watch. Do you remember in season two of Deep Space Nine when we first got the mention of the Dominion? Yeah, there's a little a little throw throwaway line. little throwaway line that had nothing to do with anything else, right? You got one of those lines in this episode. Actually, I think they mentioned it twice. It is the it is the enemy of the Asgard in the other galaxy. I'm positive of that. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly what it is. Uh, that We are going to meet them later. I'm not going to tell you who they are or what they are, but we, we are going to meet them later. And this is that sort of reference. They're already seeding that idea, you know, uh, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, okay. On to, um, on to our messages. I, I really enjoyed this episode watching it for messages this time in a way that I never have uh, before. I, I love this line. If you, Jack asked the, the Asgard, if you have the technology to stop them, how did you let these evil ones get so powerful? Hmm. And and his answer was like, well, we're not really proud of it, but we're kind of dealing with our own stuff too. And uh, basically we're bluffing because we don't really actually have that power. I don't know if there's so much a message as much as that is. A lot of think at times a mirror of society. There are things like, there are things we would love to stop evil that we would love to stop from around the world. But it turns out we got our own crap we're dealing with. What is that own crap we're dealing with? Well, I think it might be reflective a lot of mirrors here, Jeff, more reflective of what's going on with the system lords. The system lords are at the mercy of the Asgard, not because the Asgard are actually that powerful, but because they're fighting themselves. Yeah, right? Jeff, I dare say you could put this probably into any, just about any political situation out there across the globe. The reason certain people are in power is because everyone else is too busy fighting themselves. As long as you can be fight, keep people fighting themselves, you can stay in control of them. Because what is the thing that they fear the most? That we would unite under a single banner. Nothing more powerful. Nothing more powerful, you know? And that's not just political. That's not just country. Think about unions. Yeah. And how that works with, with uh, you know, if, if they freaking would just unite under one deal, look what can happen. Look what can happen. But bigger than all of that, Jack is asking Thor, what do I do? Thor won't tell him. I love what you said, Jeff. I've never thought of it before, that this is actually a setup from the Asgard the entire time, a testing, if you will. I've never thought of it that way. I never thought of the ship flying away at the end as actually they're sitting there watching the entire time. And he's like, you have it within you to make the right decision. And in the end, guess what? Jack, and Jack's the one who comes up with the idea. He does. Jack does have, and and at the beginning of the episode, what do we see? Jack's like, no, 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 don't choose me. Don't choose me. It can't be me. We've got other people. And then Thor's like, no, 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 it's you, buddy. It's you. I've got you. And then Thor later goes, yeah, I'm not telling you the right answer. You've got to figure this one out on your own. And he's leading him. He's pushing him forward. And, you know, at the end, Kronos turns around and is like, if you continue to use your Stargate when we meet you, we'll show you no mercy. And Jack's like, whatever. Yeah, we'll get you. You, you. you stop it. We'll get you. Okay. Well, I guess it just makes it more interesting while we're out there. Say hi to Ra or <laughs> Apophis or Hathor or yeah, how they doing? or Seth when you see him. Like, whatever. We could have let you go, but we didn't. But I, I, I just, I, there's such a uh, hope that we can be better in the future. We're getting there. Go back to, you've referenced it multiple times today, Jeff. You are the fifth race. You have the potential. You're getting there. And Jack says, we're there now. This is going on. Um, hope for being better in the future. You know why you can have hope that you're better in the future? Because right now you're better than you think you are. Ooh. Think about it. Think about it. Jeff, this one to me, out of seven, five chevrons. Five chevrons. Five chevrons. You could possibly talk me into going a little higher, but I really like it. I actually have four written down in my notes, but I just said that line right there, which I hadn't even thought of till in the moment. That's getting a fifth Chevron. Let's go. I love it. That's great. I had a whole thought additionally on there's a great undertone. I don't even undertone. It's a big part of the story of vengeance, right? These things happen. I'm going to seek out vengeance. But everything that you said is so much better than that. I think five Chevrons is a great call on this one. All right. Well, Jeff, I do the rating. You do the ranking. Where do you place this one in our season three? 100% completely definitive 
ranking of SG1. Currently, our uh, season ranking is number one, Into the Fire. Number two, Seth, where do you place? Number three, Fair Game. Well, it's going to be a top five episode. I can promise you that much. Bro, this is this is probably going to upset some people. This is our new number one episode. It should be. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I I love I love this episode. I thought you would. I really. There are sometimes Jeff. I just I I like Jeff's going to like this episode, and I'm just excited for him to get to this episode because I think he's going to like it. Totally one of them. Well, speaking of that, Jeff, uh, that is going to wrap up this episode. Fair game. Next time we are watching an episode called Legacy legacy what is legacy about jeff what do you think legacy is gonna if i if i think about a legacy that exists in stargate that would be meaningful to the show i think about the stargate program itself we got a a glimpse into some of that history in torment of tantalus we got the tiniest look in 1969 to some of the personnel and things like that so i think that this is going to go back even further right because the torment of tantalus showed when we discovered the stargates but they were here for a long time. So I think this is going to be some, we're going to meet somebody, get some retrospective. We're going to hear about the history of the Stargates on earth. Interesting. You're a good guesser. Oh, sure. And we'll find out next time right here on Stargate SG one for the first time. Actually, I already know Jeff doesn't though. We'll figure it out. Thank you guys for joining us. Don't forget wherever you guys get this show, please be sure to like subscribe, rate review, all those sorts of things. And please, please do share this show with somebody that you know who loves SG-1 or is in dire need of getting into the gate, just like my good buddy Jeff over there. So with that being said, until next time. Hey, Brent. Mm. Jeff. Yes. What's up, pal? Hey, I, I don't think we can release this episode. Okay. Why not? So I was, I was looking over here at the, uh, our charter that we wrote for our, our podcast here and according to section 447, subsection Alpha Bravo, line 42, we're not going to be able to take any of this stuff, use it online because the, the parrot crying out loud, Jeff. 